Hello everyone, today we talk about the English recruitment system between the 13th and 14th centuries. Um, so as probably some followers have um, noticed uh, on my channel, I haven't made many videos about British history yet. I recently created a Medieval Britain uh, playlist because I spotted you know, there were uh, at least four videos that talk about uh, British history more or less specifically in, in those videos and you know try to make group as I've done for other um, other mm, countries uh, while talking about uh, medieval history. Um, the reason however uh, up to now I've, I've already done a consistent number of video uh, practically almost um, every day uh, we 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 are uh, I'm reaching the 200 in in you know, in a pair of weeks I believe. Um, so why so few about British history really? Well, um, first of all, I, I I discuss about very broad topics. So statistically speaking, is it's not that I will fall so easily into British history. Um, say. Uh, in in this random way, but um, indeed I made um, other you know there are other playlists that I feel like medieval Germany or medieval Italy um, now also medieval France is rising. So um, I think that one of the reasons why I didn't talk very much about British history is um, more than else that um, I think uh, on the internet um, there's plenty of material that uh, deals with uh, um, British history, especially um, since I talk about the Middle Ages, I know there's plenty out there of interest, especially from uh, British people about uh, their medieval history. Uh, Britain is um, is a place where, uh, indeed, um, the Middle Ages are very highly regarded. Sometimes, um, in a um, in a too maybe enclosed way, in the sense that um, I've read many. Mm, many, um, let's say, mm, disclosure books, mm, prints that have been uh, produced in uh, in Britain for uh, largely a, a British audience, and I realized that mm, uh, even when the topic is, you know, the old Middle Ages, uh, it's mostly all about British history. Um, and a very few is said about, um, about other countries in Europe at the same time there are um, equally, if not more important, definitely. Um, and I, I've always felt, in this sense, that there is a bit uh, a sharp contrast. And even on in, in popular culture, we get to know much about um, everything that is English, and in um, in um, and consequently mm, focusing on uh, the major, let's say. Uh, the major historical events that have to do with England in a way or in another during medieval history, for which we know enough also about mm, Scotland, about Wales, about Ireland, uh, in a way that uh, is um, sometimes a bit... Um, I'm, I'm, I'm really talking in quantity because I'm happy personally to learn about British history and um, I also admit I, I know less, so I, I was slowly getting to, to this uh, last factor <laughs> that is essentially that uh, I don't really own a great knowledge about British history, so I'm, I also tend to, to say less about that because I realize that especially my audience uh, that is largely I mean, the first two countries from which I receive views is um, the U uh, United States and the United Kingdom. So sometimes in front of this audience I say, well, I if I say something that maybe they usually don't know, because, you know, it, it's not that in, in the Anglosphere, I don't know, uh, let's make some example, uh, I don't know, Bulgarian history is that is that known. Uh, the other day I, I had a Bulgarian a uh, follower that commented in my videos saying, you know, well, tell me, why don't, uh, why don't you tell more about mm, this because I'm interested myself about my own history and all. I mean, um, uh, part of, of the reason why I started this channel was to create a huge amount of videos about topics that normally in popular culture that in West is highly influenced by the, say, uh, British uh, historiography. Um, 
uh, is really not um, not much is really told about, um, and um, I've mostly concentrated on this while talking about English history of the Middle Ages. There is someone, surely someone else out there that knows much more, that also can correct what I say because it's often not correct um, uh, when I when I get into details, and that therefore creates. Um, a problem because I want to offer valid, to provide viral, valid information uh, in my through my videos, and um, sometimes I realize that I don't know uh, enough mm, for making a video uh, on a specific topic. Excuse me, a drink a little. Um, so I I, fe I felt um. I feel um, I I like I I need to do this premise because uh, I don't want to sound arrogant in the way I um, I discuss history. As a matter of fact, I conceive my videos as a sort of chat with you, so not really as lessons. And although <laughs> my my monologues can last really for very long, as it's uh, disturbingly happened <laughs> in the last days. Um, Usually, the normal length of my videos is like one hour. Maybe it's in the last days. It's approaching the Christmas holidays. I get I got a bit less busy then, um, so I, I've made even a, a two hours long video, which which is which I'd never done, <laughs> and and I hadn't planned to, to it to be that long. Because really, when I make my videos, I <laughs> just start talking. I don't stop because that's what I feel like. Um, so relatively to the English system of recruitment between let's say the end of the thirteenth and beginning and the first half of the fourteenth century is a very interesting moment in history for many reasons, and especially in English history, but let's say in Western European history in general. Um I say this because I'm pretty much involved into the period um in terms of military history, so um, also in here, I don't excessive. I don't know excessively much about the English Kingdom, and so I'm relying chiefly on on information that I found uh, here and there. Um, but the idea is um, also in here. I don't know very much, and today I, wa I want to really to talk about uh, Edward the First Statute of Winchester of 1285. Um, that is. Um, um, uh, basically, remain in force um, through the, you know, the beginning of the 14th century, and um, among other things, this statue definitely um, uh, talks about the uh, uh, basically I instituted a, a sort of watch and uh, um, and uh, I think reformed the recruitment system. Eventually, there was a further. Um, um adjustment uh in the forties of the fourteenth century by um because of obviously of, of the great transformations that were happening um uh, uh at the time this was done under uh uh Edward, uh, under, uh edward the third that was uh the greatest and uh Ge a military genius in English history. No, it wasn't Marlborough. It wasn't. It was really Edward III. Edward III was the most complete military genius uh, of English history. Many people measure, um, you know, military genius on uh, as if they were, um, you know, judging a football uh, a match. Like uh, how many battles the general won, and that makes what a military genius a genius is. No, it, it it really doesn't work that way. Um, you can even lose all battles, still be a military genius. <laughs> well, I it's this is a bit ex extreme. Obviously, it didn't happen that way, but definitely, a military genius stands also in the um, in the ability of being um, 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 a, a complete uh, uh, military uh, commander. I mean, uh, the completeness of the um, um, military um, ability. Edward the Third. Um, created um, the the army in history that was uh, uh, that, that obtained mm, 
more results in tactical terms. I mean, there is no other army in the history of the world that has achieved um, in, in terms of um, looking at the uh, number ratio of the mm, uh, of the uh, of the fighting armies, such um, as astonishing uh, victories um, against an enemy was essentially of the same, um, let's say, of, um, of the same nature, of the same s um, d in conditions of symmetry. We can't say even if symmetry is a very bad word in military terms because symmetry doesn't exist. War is um, asymmetric by definition at any time. Um, unfortunately, uh, journalistic terms today have thrown out this these horrible wars like um, symmetric warfare and asymmetric warfare that is really um, a, a, an amount of a, I don't want to use bad words, but it's really rubbish, utter rubbish, and just express the uh, deeply rooted ignorance of these people in uh, in military matters and. Um, as well as geopolitics uh, and stuff like that, and um, I will have to explain because I'm telling it um, I'm <laughs> uh, rather too much in my videos. At least I, uh, maybe I said it mm, twice or thrice up to now, but it's really enough for my complaining <laughs> um, um, standards. And the um, um, the idea is that people don't understand much about military history in general. Th that's the reason why I'm discussing about this, because um, I don't believe, I mean, history is really an opinion in some measure, but there are here also in here certain standards, certain criteria that if you don't meet, uh, you can't even, you shouldn't tell the truth, even participate to the debate. I mean, it's it, it would be useful at least for you to read more. And and then to talk. I myself am not a, a such a, a huge expert in military history, but although it, it's what I do <laughs> as a living, um, uh, in terms of studying it, and um, so I, I I I try to stay humble enough, enough to, relatively to, to 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 you know by 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 good manner, <laughs> let's say, um, but. Um, Really, there is too much uh, disinformation about warfare, about military history, and and this is reflected, by the way, the, the poor civic um, uh, value that that exists in our society. I mean, if you don't understand uh, military history, you don't understand a whole lo a lot of other things about politics, about society, about human nature, and. And an extremism prevails. Oh, obviously, military history is not easy to understand. That's what I'm making all these problems when discussing about it because I, I really care uh, about the respon the inherent responsibility that lays in, in in explaining it. So let's try to get this done. So essentially, the statute of Winchester is you know medieval Europe had this kind of. Um, England was a very uh, had a, a very mm, good mm, military organization in considering the average of of um, of medieval of medieval Europe, uh, chiefly because it was a, a kingdom uh, with an ancient degree of development. Like the even before the Norman conquest, the the Anglo-Saxons had um, one of the most uh, advanced. Um, uh, say uh, administration systems um, out there uh, and, and, and which included by the way the, the uh, recruitment system that was partly inherited by by the Normans who however created this feudal kingdom um, on the French model that uh, obviously implied also the, the creation of, of uh, uh, the, the, a different uh, a recordment system. However, let's say that generally speaking, all the feudal um, of the feudal kingdoms in Europe had this kind of uh, feudal structure for which it was a, a, a bulk of nobles that had to provide this the the the, the heavy cavalry ar around which basically revolved all medieval armies um, uh, at a time or another, um, especially in this. Uh, in these centuries, especially during the 13th, there was the peak of of of, um, of chivalric warfare, we can say. But the mm, the rest of the freemen that partly lived also in on feudal uh, estates and all um, had to provide uh, a um, 
and, and, and local in Minsk, there were not much on feudal estates because up to that point, yeah, that 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 is true as well. But uh, let's say that were especially in still uh, even in, in the most feudalized uh, countries of Europe large communities of freemen that were organized uh, usually in pre-feudal fashion in the sense that uh, as we can see uh, in England even the um, uh, the boroughs and, and shires were uh, essentially something that had not to do with the feudal system. There were the, the, the repartitions of, of England as it was conceived administratively speaking, so from let's say a centralistic point of view, uh, because they uh, they all they were controlled essentially by by uh, royal officials in some measure, and this happened also everywhere in Europe, uh, elsewhere in Europe. Just that the England maintained um, the, mm, probably more than other regions of Europe, like France, this kind of uh, idea of self-organization was very important because indeed, uh, for many historical reasons that you can grasp. Um, first of all, the fact that, that Norman feudalism had been imported into England, that even if it had been successful, there was still a large part of, uh, uh, of Anglo-Saxon mm, you know, um, um, influence in the system that couldn't be erased, because it couldn't be erased and unless the, the, the Anglo-Saxon population had been erased, and that was not possible. Um, that you can understand also in the fate of the uh, English monarchy in many ways. Uh, think about the Magna Carta, 1215, that followed the previous uh, uh, the, the, the disastrous defeat of the Anglo-Germans at the Battle of Bouvine, and that basically um, impressed to these otherwise solid uh, feudal uh, kingdom a, let's say, a, a, a counterbalance represented by, yes, still the feudal nobility, but partly also by the idea that there was a, a broader community of, 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 of commoners, in a certain sense, uh, freemen that um, um, could still counterbalance essentially the, the, uh, the royal power. Um, so in all this, with the statute of Winchester, we s uh, and we see the, the usual problem of feudal uh, monarchs, that was the one of recruitment, among the other things. Uh, this was, by the way, an era, and we will see it, in, in to which uh, it wasn't just about the old recruitment system for which every freeman had to go there with his own weapons and being called up and joined you. Um, at this time, Europe is really transforming fastly, itself uh, towards a sort of uh, entrepreneurial um, um, war um, organization for which most of the people remained at home while there were some professionals that um, were out there and carrying out at least the, uh, the greatest military force. Um, and, and the big problem in here was obviously that um, uh, there was a need for recording people that was very theoretical because if you read the, I mean, the, the need was pretty concrete, but the, the recruitment laws were pretty theoretical in many ways because um, sometimes we count things that, I don't know, if all the freemen of, uh, of one country, let's say like England, had uh, been recruited. I mean, all the eligible people for uh, for recruitment, you, c you could count uh, even millions. Um, but this evidently was not possible. Um, the most important thing was recruiting, let's say, a, a, a core, a critical mass of, of soldiers that could be effective and uh, tactically and, and strategically a, as, a military, uh, uh, as a military force. Um, and that had to respond also to certain uh, standards of equipment. Mm. Uh, because you can bring huge masses of peasants into war f uh, for, for no use, essentially. Uh, and uh, the big problem here was that definitely uh, equipment, good equipment, costed a lot. So in all history, it's always been the other, uh, the, the same story, uh, the same old story, you know, the idea that a society has a certain equilibrium, that um, um, uh, the, uh, y y let's say that you, you can't always have um, uh, 
uh, a responsive population in terms of recruitment, both because the population can resist to levy, um, because it can get too poor, that it can provide equipment for itself. So in turn, this, the, the, the state, let's say, uh, the monarchy has to start creating something more centralized to, to draw resources from somewhere else or in a certain fashion and to organize uh, different um, a different um, military model, let's say, in terms of, of armies. Um, so this is all really the history of, of, of the military history of, of the world. Even before um, tactics, even before battles, even before actual campaigns. Um, and, and this is what shaped, uh, in, in many ways, also the modern state. Because the sake of centralization, let's say, the centralization of um, of of monarchies throughout all European history came chiefly from the sake of um, military expenses. Many people still reason in these childish terms like, "Oh no, it was the the the, the evil guy at the top who wanted the money from the poor people." No, it wasn't like that. It was really that uh, every kingdom in Europe at this time was being was threatened to be wiped out from a moment to another from by its enemies. So it is true that what these states needed was money. Uh, and taxes, but the the, <laughs> the basically all the expenses were absorbed by um, by the the the, the armies, mm -hmm. and that were needed to 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 survive. And it was uh, in this uh, chaotic uh, political landscape of, of medieval Europe. So the, the mm, uh, these armies still corresponded, by the way, in part definitely to the to the will of a country. As a conceived as a community, as say a, as a nation, we can even if the term is anachronistic by this time in many ways, but there was definitely a sense of belonging, uh, a common identity that understood that you know taking arms for a certain cause was fine. I mean, here we're talking about England essentially in the days of the War of Scottish Independence. Uh, and that hell was, w w you know, from the Scottish side, even if it was a, a very um, tough stand for, for a common reason, so you, that you can argue that Scotland was divided into cluster principalities, practically, but uh, it was still a kingdom in the, uh, say, in the national, proto-national sense of the world, in front of this other big, powerful system that was the English, the English kingdom that was trying to essentially keep them keep those uh, Scots uh, subjugated. Um, so uh, Edward I was uh, uh, Edward <laughs> um, the uh, definitely the uh, long, uh, long shanks uh, the so-called um, uh, I think it was the, the, the Malleus Scotorum so the, the hammer of the Scots so the guy that uh, definitely was involved in in, in, in much really of the um, subjugation of the uh, uh, of Scotland uh, at this time, um, and a warfare was was all out there. I mean, it the the needs of uh, of recruitment were pretty um, pretty evident. So in the city of Winchester, there was similarly to other recruitment um, documents. Uh, all over Europe, the uh, essentially a list of, of military classes of recruitment that corresponded to essentially the um, the individual um, were proportional to the individual um, uh, the personal revenues essentially of the uh, of the able uh, freemen. So um, the the list here, uh, I'm, I'm just gonna read it. I don't know which translation that this is, but it should be fine. So among the various things that that, um, that the statute says, it is uh, it says it is likewise commanded that every man in his house arms for keeping the peace in accordance with the ancient assies. Um, mm, so the the assize of arms uh, was this ordinance of 1252 that had been proclaimed by a Henry III of England um, concerning in turn the enforcement of the uh, assize of arms of uh, 1181. So it, it basically appointed certain constables to, to summon men to arms. 
um, quell um, uh, breach, uh, the breaches of, of peace, all things. Um, 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 essentially, the seize of arm was concerned the obligation of all freemen of England to possess and bear arms mm. in the service of the king and, and realm, and including the uh, swearing allegiance to the king. Mm. Um, so this was the the unity that was um, um, required um, at the time. Ideally, to say in. Uh, for for the uh, mm, the good of the kingdom, you know, and um, so uh, I go on with the statute. Then it says, namely, that every man between fifteen years and sixty be assessed and sworn to arms according to the amount of his lands and of his chattels. That is to say, and then it it starts uh, listing the uh, the classes of. Um, of census, we can say, <laughs> using a Roman term. So then it says, for 15 pounds of land and, and I'd say, or, or 40 marks worth of chattels, so the, the, the two things could do, could do uh, could go both ways in the sense that at this time there were also a lot of people who made a living out of trade. Maybe they, did, they didn't own um, land, or uh, but still they had lots of, of uh, mobile um, Riches, so they also had to participate to the arm me or sending someone. I think uh, here I, I don't think the statute says that, but I think it was partially implied in some way. Then it says uh, it, it, this guy with 15 pints of land or, or, or 40 marks worth of chattels has to provide an alberg, so that's mail shirt, a helmet of iron, a sword, a knife, and a horse. So this guy actually makes up the um, the typical uh, medieval knight. Mm -hmm. um, so it's interesting that uh, you know the the knight here. It doesn't mention, for instance, the lanks. I noticed that many recruitment systems the, the lanks is uh, for cavalry is somehow somehow not. Uh, not really uh, mentioned. Uh, I don't know why. Um, I know that in later times, like um, 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 definitely the um, the monarchy pr could provide. I mean, it's not the case of England, but I think it, it might have been definitely possible. Parts of this equipment. Uh, this usually happened through mer mercantile commissions, like um, uh, before centralization, so the actual production of certain weaponry uh, that could be ca kept into royal warehouses and stuff like that. Uh, there were still certain, um, mm, mm, you know, uh, definitely were still mm, mm, um, certain uh, deposits, uh, I don't know how to say that, um, that were used. Um, uh, during uh, during campaigns to to, um, uh, mm, uh, to to keep weapons that evidently could not just be brought from the guys from home, also because during a campaign uh, weapons and armor uh, went um, went destroyed in in part, so th there was the necessity of having s a certain um, uh, a certain um, um, escorts uh, like uh, excuse me a certain stocks, certain r reserves, and um, that went along obviously with, uh, with supplies for actually only feeding the army, so um, so the idea that Lanx is not there is, I don't know how to, to, to consider it, probably uh, it was given to these soldiers um, at a certain point. But for the rest, of the equipment is completely um, because the lax doesn't cost actually extremely much. It has to be well done. It definitely has a, 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 a consistent price, but it, it's never as um, expensive like the Oberg, uh, an iron helmet, a sword, uh, a knife, and a horse all together, mm -hmm. um, which were obviously required to the guy that had this uh, amount of um, enough amount of, of, of wealth. Um, still, it's interesting, however, that this um, class is required a knife. Mm. I mean, you're basically asking a guy to to present to to master uh, equipped, uh, fully equipped as as a as a uh, heavily armored uh, cavalryman. And all you ask, uh, among all the things you ask, there is uh, it's specified you must have a knife. 
Mm -hmm. Now knives also maybe are even less expensive than than lances. I don't know. Um, probably not because certain knives were even like stocks something. Uh, you know, metal did cost a lot at this time. Uh, um, but I mean, these are the questions that you might wonder: Why, why are you issued an, a knife uh, and and not a lance? Among the other things, because um, here probably it means um, it tells how important really knives were actually in in uh, in, in chivalric warfare. Sometimes we underestimate that that um, clashes between knights were were sometimes also very physical. They weren't just this um, let's say um, choreographed duels or simple cavalry charges. Were knights really getting? physically on, on someone else and trying to, to, to bring him to the, to the ground like mm, uh, and and trying to, to breach uh, essentially the, the, the weak uh, armor uh, the weak spots of the armor with uh, with stocks to, to really go down and to, to kill the guy because it's also very difficult to kill a guy uh, that is where that is fully armored uh, even at that time where plate armor was uh, was actually spreading already at this time but it was um, still um, a, a rare commodity um, so that's part of the reason but a knife also can turn out to be useful in many other occasions then passing to the second class then it says for 10 pounds worth of land and 20 marks worth of capitals of chattels, sorry. Um, uh, the guy is. Ha um, this is. I'm. Uh, I'm adding it. Uh, it has. He, um, has to provide a uh, hauberg, so a sleeveless hauberg, a helmet, a sword, and a knife. Mm -hmm. um, this is interesting. Um, first of all, um, you can immediately spot here what the difference is. Essentially. Um, the the first class was fifteen pounds of land, and 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 forty marks of chattels. This is instead ten pounds uh, of land and twenty marks of world of chattels. So, the the idea is that um, here probably the uh, um, the land is considered uh, to be. Still more productive than chattels. I mean, here it says that you, if you are a landowner, you you have implicitly more um, more resources than simply something cashed. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know how how these measures were calculated, but it's, it's it's evident that in order to have had an equal proportion, mathematically speaking, the fifteen pounds would have had to pass to seven pounds and a half in front of the um uh, the uh, uh the the uh, uh the uh the the uh, mm, halvening let's say of the forty marks in two twenty. Uh here um we have a lighter um cavalryman still with an um uh, with a sleeveless uh Holberg, so still something pretty decently armored um sleeves led uh, sleeveless Oberg aren't um um i mean here we we're not talking about probably with some s a certain sleeve meant to be to to cover the the shoulder in my opinion um because that's the the only thing i have in mind actually i've never seen now when i think about it uh, as a completely sleeveless Oberg like at, at least the the, the forearm um is um ex at least the arm is covered then the forearm may be not so he's still a pretty heavily armored guy with a helmet a sword and a knife uh then the third class um says for a hundred shillings uh worth of land so the um the the shilling here um uh at this time was um, usually uh, I think a pound is like twenty shillings, but I think at this time I read it was like one twelfth of a pound. So um, to to make uh, a speedy uh, calculation, we're talking about essentially uh, eight pounds, if if I'm not wrong with maths. 
I was a disaster in math. It's <laughs> math in school, but it should be it. So not um, an excessively um, 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 a, a small amount of land. Um, and this is the only uh, requirement because it doesn't add um, Mark's worth of chattels. Mm -hmm. So this basically implies that the um, mm, basically that the mobile goods were mm, required only uh, were considered as a let's say um, as the base for for armament only to consistently wealthy guys like consistently wealthy merchants I believe um, to make an equation in the, to society at this time uh, while if you had mm, maybe um, the, the here the the uh, in in proportion uh, a consistent amount of chattel mm, mm, in proportion to the this um, eight pounds of land this a uh, hundred shillings you you were not required so you understand that there is a sort of of of, um, of, of step mm, for which um, the idea was that still that in order to participate to the army you had to be mostly a landowner then only excessively wealthy people mm, that weren't landowners were required uh, uh, to, to participate to the army and as um, essentially as um, um, as cavalry although uh, the the thing we, we didn't notice about the second class that is important that a horse is not required now this is interesting because I still believe that these um, recruitment statutes are pretty theoretical. I think that the guy with a helmet, a sword, a knife and a uh, halberdian was still meant to fight on horseback. Sure there was heavy infantry and generally speaking however that was made up also by dismounted uh, cavalry. Uh, so it's possible that this time the Kingdom of England was able to provide also some horses for these guys. So these recruitment things, uh, you, you don't have to imagine them as uh, literal. These are just kind of approximations, they are kind of very practical uh, measures that um, do not tell us a lot else about how really the military organization really was because there was really behind that something that was not issued but that the um, it was actually the central government was taking care of because the king had its own money that invested evenly um, uh, entrusting in, in it to commissioners to raise the provisions the uh, our extra equipment horses uh, and all that were eventually distributed to the army in this sense but let's say that this uh, regulations mean um, to 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 uh, to show essentially what what part the the private had to uh, to to make um, uh, in uh, in for essentially for for uh, helping the the kingdom uh, in, in its military efforts. Um, so the hundred shillings worth of land <laughs> um, uh, uh, obliged the guys to provide a doublet. That is a sort of padded. A defensive jacket, like a sort of a um, uh, padded coat uh, um, a, a gambeson, that, that's the term, um, a helmet of iron, a sword and a knife. Um, the probably here the helmet of iron here I don't have really the original text but it is a translation but I think um, that here the word helmet that recurs also in, in the previous classes uh, might have actually meant something different from class to class um, uh, it says a, a doubled a sword and a knife so really a uh, kind of equipment that kind of fit also for medium infantry um, this guy is basically is unarmored it has only a padded coat so it doesn't sound really as a knight or it, it might maybe serve as a sort of hobular I don't know um, sort of light calorie man for um, 
then it's uh, the, the, the passing to the fourth category. It says uh, for fur forty shillings. So for um, something like uh, three more than three pounds, something more than three pounds, um, a worth of land and over up to hundred shillings worth, mm, so between three and eight pounds essentially of of, of uh, land property. Um, it was issued a sword, a bow, arrows, and a knife. This is very interesting because this is uh, even for an archer. Mm. The archer here is equipped with a sword, inter interestingly, and a knife. Doesn't have any uh, armor, apparently. Um, but I still think that the guy who went to war might have still brought something like a padded coat or maybe was given by 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 the army, let's say. Um, but it's still the important thing about this class is that we're talking about archers, mm -hmm. and you know that uh, archer warfare is actually is increasingly important in, in in this phase of medieval England, especially during the Scottish the Scottish campaigns. Um, then he um, he was less than forty shillings worth of land, so like uh, uh, less than three pounds. Uh, shall be sworn to have a uh, shites, uh, I believe it's the right uh, thing, uh, gizarn. This is interesting because the, the gizarn is um, um, a polearm with two-sided blade. Um, at least, I, I don't know whether this is really so categorical because I think it here the gizarn is meant really to be a, a polearm of, of some sort with probably of certain length more than a having a specific, um, mm, let's say, amount of blades. Um, standardization wasn't really out there. Uh, how we uh, we we um, we conceive it. Um, knives and other small weapons. Now this is interesting because it, it sounds like um, this is this was the. Um, Considering the equipment of the Gizar, and this was meant to be probably the standard infantryman mm -hmm. um, of of medieval armies. And then it said shites. Shites here, I believe, were sorts of um, um, sort of literally the ones that were used for not really even for for actual. Combat. I mean, the shites. Yeah, it could, it's sort of pole arm in practice. Uh, I don't know which. Uh, um, um, there were also falchions uh, at, at this time. I think like uh, like those. That, uh, the shites uh, is is still similar to 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 the G's arm in practice. So it, the, um, I think it they bear it, the 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 kind of weaponry that there. It, it's listed here is really meant to be very approximate, like shites and gizarns could be qu really quite similar. So these were essentially the, the light infantry mm, that however was uh, made up the, 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 the numerical bulk of, of the army, I think. Um, it's very interesting that, that this was required, that it was the, um, this was an inferior class of recruitment than, than archers, because usually uh, in medieval Europe the um, um let's say the the infantry the the um the the average um melee infantry was um considered the um i mean the average infantry was considered more than archers like if you take i don't know communal italy for instance um what what those armies were essentially required was to have a, a strong bulk of lancers of spearmen and then archers were left essentially as a minor thing. Um, the, they were less in numbers and uh, like in here, by the way, but they were considered, even if very important troops still sort of mm, support of the infantry that was the most important thing. Here instead, it's interesting that in, in, the, in the list, actually the, the archer comes before the spearman. 
Um, and this tells you probably how important archery was starting to, to become into English armies. Um, what is interesting about this spearman is that he's required a knife, um, not a sword, that is said is required to the bowman, um, but also other small weapons that I think are not specified in the original text. And, and this means that this infantry was probably not excessively strong. Um, there is also a problem in 13th century warfare relatively to the actual role of um, infantry into, um, inf into feudal warfare, because this was the time, especially in the most feudalized lands of, of, of Europe, of which England was, was an example, although already a bit less than countries like France or Germany, uh, of essentially the mm, the almost the, the virtually insignificant role of infantry on the battlefields. This actually comes also from a particular nature of the sources that sometimes were written to praise uh, knights and were written because they were commissioned by by the chivalric elite essentially and 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 and. And, and this doesn't, didn't really um, like commoners. They they wanted essentially even to erase their own um, th the memory of their own presence on the battlefields in a certain measure. But in here, it's still and but as as far as we know, in, in general, aside from certain areas of Europe that were more advanced in terms of of infantry, like the Flanders, Brabant, and and especially Italy. Um, the um, the infantry really seems to have been um, a minor a minor tactical uh, force uh, on in um, in armies like I don't know the French ones but also the English ones and I think that here we are in 1285 so infantry warfare is slowly gaining um, momentum um, but still in this uh, recruitment list we have that um, bowmen come first than, than infantrymen. Mm. This might have been a particular English characteristics because as we've said uh, in English warfare uh, archery was rising so it might have been that I don't know if this had been a French um, um, order of recruitment, ordinance of recruitment, maybe the, the archers would have come after the, the infantry. Um, but I, I think it's very, very meaningful. And the present, the um, uh, um, the order of, uh, of providing um, uh, uh, other small weapons together with, with knives um, um, really tells you that these guys were probably also used for um, for certain, say, logistical functions, uh, certain like uh, the clearance of the battlefield, the, the building of of certain field fortifications and stuff like that. Then uh, the other class, uh, we we go always lower. The other class says he who has less than 20 marks in chattels. So here the chattels come back. So 20 marks in chattels is presenting as um, uh, once again. So I was wrong before by saying that um, the reason uh, the mark in ch um, um, the, the marking in chattel didn't carry more, but still it's meaningful because it's. Uh, it it means that um, we we're getting lower really also in quality because here it says you have to have swords, knives, and other small weapons. So the fact that the presence of swords here uh, might might make you wonder, but maybe these guys were issued with swords, but still were uh, kind of um, uh, of um, equipped maybe with spears as well by the I don't know. Um, by the the army, it's possible. Then it says knives and other small weapons. So these seem to be a bit of the equivalent of the forty shillings worth of land. Um, and um, hmm. the fact that they're asked for swords, it might be that these guys um, that had chattels wealth might have actually been. Uh, um 
Like, like 40 shillings worth of land may have been of the peasantry, while these guys were chattels being uh, bourgeois, I mean, commoners living in into uh, cities that could maybe more easily access even swords from the local markets than, than a peasant, than a, than a guy living in the country could. But it's very speculative. So probably these guys still made up uh, the infantry together with the uh, the guys with Scheitz and Gisarn. Uh, Scheitz and Gisarn in this sense might have been you know, the Scheid is a typical, um, you know, these, these pole arms were all derived from essentially agricultural tools. So here I think the hypothesis that there is a differentiation between the guys who lived in the country and the one who lived in the boroughs can kind of, kind of, kind of make sense. It might be, I'm just speculating. Then it says, and all others who can do so shall have bows and arrows outside the forests and within them bows and bowls. That is being translated uh, as crossbows um, and bowls for crossbows. Mm -hmm. So, what I find is, so this is a class of the, the the poorest, essentially, the and it is normal for medieval standards that the poorest classes were issued with um, with bows. Normally, this is something that existed since the migration era. It remained there basically in all all over Europe as a normal thing. Um, um, in this sense, I still find interesting that there is essentially two classes of bowmen: the one were equipped with a sword and uh, uh, the uh, bow arrows and knives, these guys instead should only have bows practically because they're not e they're e they're issued e not even they're they're neither issued uh, knives and other small uh, weapons so this is very meaningful so they're the poorest guys and, and what I find especially more interesting here it says um, that ha they have to provide bows and arrows outside the forests um, now, if I'm really translating well, because this is the r also one point, <laughs> these guys were woodmen. I mean, this was a class of, th of the poorest inhabitants of England that lived and dwelled into the forest. Uh, England at this time was covered in the more than today, I, uh, I guess, um, in by very big, um, important forests, from which we know that actually um, a lot of archers, of, of prized archers, came. Uh, there were certain regions of England that were particularly prized for archers. Um, the myth that the English learned to use longbow from Wales is 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 a myth, really. It's completely false. Um, English made extensive use of, of longbows, like every, uh, just as much as, as the Welsh. There is no concrete evidence of, of any use of, of any, let's say, Welsh influence in the development of English uh, archery, which is what most people ignore. Really, just read things like Brad Bradbury's medieval archery. Um, and other things, because today we know historiographical thi historiographically speaking that the myth of uh, th that the English needed to adopt the, the longbow from the Welsh because they, they didn't know it before, they didn't use it as much, it's completely false. It's a, it's a completely modernistic and mechanicistic and technologistic uh, stereotype and prejudice that has no uh, ground in military history. Uh, in the real military history, not the ones of the guys who get on the internet and uh, read a bunch of things and then and then think they have known it all. Um, so the um, um, uh, so here uh, the the guys are issued bows and arrows outside of forests because it basically means that they had, in my opinion, at least, that they had to provide these things for, for a military service. Because one thing is to um, 
as we will see, these basically were certain royal uh, officials that went around the country to recruit these guys. So the point was not much about having arrows and bows where you lived, like in a forest where you use probably arrows and bow every day uh, for hunting and stuff like that, but the fact of having some of them that you could carry out in the military service. So this is really the point. Uh, so it's very interesting that these forest men, uh, these wood men, were considered as skilled bowmen. Then it says here, uh, I'm reading a translation, and I remember uh, from, I'll tell you the book, because so I can source it properly. And I, I, I couldn't find, uh, uh, it's um, Firearms Law and Second Amendment, Regulation Rights and Policy, page uh, 80. This is what I'm reading from. I didn't quote the orders, sorry. What's their name? Uh, by uh, Nicholas J. Johnson, David B. Copel, George A. Moxery, Michael P. O'Shee. Hmm. So, okay. I, I had not a real <laughs> I realized that, <laughs> that the book was named this way, just found it. Um, the. Um, so I think it's pretty evident, and here it says, I mean the author has written that basically the differentiation between uh, arrows and bolts stands basically in the differentiation between um, uh, arrow, uh, I mean mm, bow arrows and crossbow arrows. Mm. So it's interesting that there is a mention, at least, I should have brought the original text, and I really, now I'm really having uh, I'm really repenting because let's say if we can't find the original text, so I'm, I'm getting curious now. Uh, Winchester Statutes. Well, whatever, we're losing too much time. But I, I, I agree. I mean, surely the word crossbow in England, usually that uh, you, people say, oh, well, the um, there is this prejudice for, for which uh, the English had only to use the longbow. No. There were also crossbows, notoriously. Um, and, and they were widespread, uh, even in England. So, um, and this proves it, I believe, uh, quite eloquently. Um, and what I, uh, what I care about this is um, stressing, however, the, that definitely bows had their own importance and were considered evidently as something that could that could be provided quite easily. I mean, the area of England was full of good bowmen, and we know that because simply the uh, the English bowmen were paid in during these times, during the Scottish campaigns, more than, uh, than Welsh archers, and that's a pretty uh, meaningful indicator that even in terms of quality, Welsh archers weren't probably that much compared to, to certain, uh, to, to the English ones. I mean, I'm sure that there were good Welsh archers, but once again, uh, we have to dispel this myth of the um, the derivation of the, uh, 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 the of longbow from Wales into England, because it's really not how it happened. And the the spread of the of the longbow in England, um, in, in 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 especially in fourteenth in from the end of the thirteenth and in in fourteenth century, is something that really happened because of a, um, I can't talk about a reform, but it's really, um, at one point, the English monarchs realized that in order to fight against the thickly compact Scottish formations, they needed more archers. So what happens is not that the English uh, men began to, to, um, to adopt the longbow from someone else. It's simply that they already had it. But the monarchy began to issue them to, to be equipped with that and to train with that more, to have larger numbers mm, uh, for the pool of record men to use against these uh, infantries and later against the uh, even uh, heavy cavalry with, uh, with a great success, as we know. Um, so this is really how it happened. And forget about the Welsh thing, because uh, it's false. Um, the um, so this was the last um, uh, class of recruitment, and then it says, and that uh, the view of arms be made twice a year. Mm -hmm. 
um, and, and, and in each hundred and liberty let um, two constables be chosen to make the view of arms and the aforesaid constables shall when the justices assigned to this come to the district present before them that full uh, they have found in arms in watch keeping and in highways and present also people who harbor strangers in upland villes from whom they are not willing to answer so these are all problems also of that do not deal specifically with the equipment. Whatever. So let's pass so to to a broader um, to how the recruitment actually was carried out. So we have seen something now how mm, there were certain royal officials that were sent. So the normal procedures for calling this tr calling these troops. Uh, um, calling out uh, these troops was for the king to issue a commission of array mm -hmm. um, which means that s substantially were some commissioners were usually knights or sometimes members of the king's ho ho uh, household um, who um, were appointed uh, to call uh, on both shires and boroughs to provide men for military service um, so uh, there was, um, let's say, d mm, as you know, shires and 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 and, and towns, and boroughs were essentially, uh, as we were saying, uh, the uh, the administrative repartitions into which England was parcelled, and uh, each one of them had historically a, um, a certain mm, capability, mm. Um, and had an an old a certain number of troops to to the sovereign so there were maybe certain shires that were extremely uh were pretty large demographically so they they needed to to give more and others that were smaller needed to give less um same for towns mm. um the at this time england was pretty much rural i mean towns were not really much developed so we're talking mostly about um peasants in in practice um the mm, so the the choice um, uh, um the commissioners basically selected uh this quota of men for for each uh, administrative repartition by uh, selecting the um the strongest and most vigorous men that were out there so relatively to the the, mm, the theoretical nature of the recruitment uh, ordinances um, all men between 16 and 60 years uh, of age had to participate to 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 the military uh, expeditions when called but evidently it, Mm, there was only an amount of people who participated. I mean, those were eligible in theory. Mm, we're, we're talking essentially about the whole male population of England because, um, you know, the people didn't live that much, so only, only the people who, um, who were older than, than 60 years old weren't that common <laughs> at that time. Um, didn't make s definitely a great uh, a great demographical strength and, and nor obviously a great uh, a physical force uh, if you are younger than 16 you're just a kid but there are I don't know certain 14 years old kids that are pretty pretty tough even more than 30 a certain certain people in their 20s so we can imagine that as always into history also y younger people were were called to arms i mean it, it was normal to see i don't know 12 uh, 12 years old joining uh, the military by the way consider that this we know that this happened regularly even uh, in the roman army in in any times in history a uh, time in history consider also one thing that the people at that time aged uh, earlier um this is this is not just a a, um, a common place it, it's it's really true i mean a uh, um a boy or a girl at, at 12 14 13 14 years old were pretty pretty much adult they they usually also married at that age um they um so they were considered and and they they were brought into a lifestyle that was pretty pretty hard uh and that toughened them up 
mm, substantially. So for being a soldier, you know, probably if you even if you were younger than 16 years old, you, you could go. This probably all depended on. Uh, I mean, these regulations were definitely a political weapon in the sense that, as we will see, there, there was a lot of resistance to the recruitment um, for mm, political reasons. Uh, so, because the kings wanted to 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 obviously uh, make this extra mm, uh, military service, we're calling this extra military service by kind of tricking the ordinances and doing something sneaky etc so um, the people didn't want this because obviously it was uh, uh, it was mostly an economical cause cost I mean uh, think about a family whose um, father whose husband basically goes to war wh who is gonna work in the land those were very important problems for from for for the medieval world and not just for the medieval world um, so there was a resistance in that sense but paradoxically speaking, uh, people were probably not so fussy about age either. Mm. I mean, if they saw a pretty strong 14-year-old, they said, you know, and their parents said, okay, uh, maybe um, you could be sent, so why not? Um, but w we, m we can't imagine that those who were um, ha um, recruited were usually in their 20s. Um, so they're the toughest guy, the one who have more immediate energy, um, can be better as uh, probably also more stupid <laughs> um, w which which makes for in the military in the sense that um, I was uh, I was listening just a, a couple of days ago a, uh, a Viet um, Vietnam's veteran uh, interview and he, he stated that clearly I mean said when you're 18 19 you can be sent in a you know at a bayonet attack um, when you're 40 you would say things like, well, okay, let's talk about <laughs> it. You know, there is also this um, uh, age mindset that, that is really important in many ways and has to be considered in military affairs. Um, so, the uh, I wanted just to quote one thing, probably military men will hate me for <laughs> this, but Frederick II, the great, Frederick uh, of Hohenzollern, the great Prussian king, said once something like, I I don't know if it's um, attributed to him or if it is a, uh, an actual statement of him. He said something, you know, if if my soldiers began to think, I wouldn't have an army. Mm. It's pretty meaningful. Uh, and this is really how certain things happen. I mean, if you look at hi in history, you know, the, the more um, you don't need people who think too much. So you into into battle. You have people who, act, who know how to act. First of all, then thinkers are maybe better f as commanders. Mm rather than the truth but whatever um, so um, the mm, the di subdivision of these groups was sometimes um, sometimes you uh, I find written things that uh, um, these men were uh, organized in twenties hundreds and occasionally even thousands under officers who were called respectively vintners, centeners and milliners these were typical terms that exist all over the Middle Ages, that they came straight from the Roman military um, vocabulary um, into the Middle Ages, and, um, and uh, these were probably people who, as I was saying before, dependingly on the, the, the size of the community, obviously there were more people who were sent in. Um, but I think that they might have also corresponded to a for um, let's say a smaller repartition of, of the troops um, in the sense that um, as we will see it in a while um, the um, the actual knightly elite was a very few men mm, usually well not so few but uh, depending really depending on the the, mm, the community we're called from but really the bulk of the people, numerically speaking, were these commoners with, uh, we've seen pole arms, bows and all. And these were peasants, usually drawn from communities that more or less knew each other. So th there was, first of all, a certain esprit de corps already, already on this base. And uh, for the sake of organics, there is always a sort of hierarchical repartition. So it's possible that vintenars, centeners and millenars weren't just um, the single... I'm sure, actually, weren't single mm, 
uh, commanders of these groups, but probably there were twenties, hundreds, and 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 uh, and thousands that, in in this sense, were considered in in a hierarchical way, um, in the various uh, ranks, let's say. And this is important also tactically speaking, because tactically speaking, does doesn't make sense to have thousands of people without a an, an inner order. There were obviously a smaller repetitions. Um, that function also tactically in, 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 a, in a certain fashion. So the thousands were really the, the whole group, the whole army. Then the, the sentinels were mm, commanded um, probably something like a, a company-sized um, um, group and uh, the vintners something like a platoon. That's, that's the, the, the concept. Um, and that's more or less, you, I, it's interesting how in history these numbers always are pretty similar. I mean the repetitions, uh, the organical repetitions uh, are, al are always more or less the same. There is especially chiefly this kind of company sized unit of 100, 150 men and then smaller repetitions with certain particular tactical roles and then the big, let's say, uh, regiment size. <laughs> Um, um, a group that uh, all have um, an, an organizational tactical purpose in, in practice at the same time. Um, so um, this recruitment system implied that, um, as we've read, that twice a year um, uh, there would be inspections of the men and their equipment. So um, the idea is that uh, the commissioners had to prevent any attempt of fraud or deception, um, that the guys had to be always um, mm, uh, mm, uh, equipped in for, for emergencies. So they had to be uh, recruited quickly. They already had um, to have their, their gear ready. Um, um we have seen it also with the the guy we with the woodman that of course they always had weapons like bows in, in at home but they also had to have weapons that they could take out of the forest let's say to go to war for with um so relatively to numbers we have um you know as we were saying before the the, the, the theoretical main power available was pretty large and uh, in 1339, uh, um, uh, the 37 English counties raised uh, a number of um, uh, 1,477 men-at-arms, 5,600 archers, and 5,600 arm armati in Latin, uh, which is a very good uh, proportion that really tells you we are in 1339, so this time English armies are mm, already shaped in a certain way by the military genius of Edward III. So they're a bit different from the late 13th century armies. What do you see here, and that I discussed also in, in, uh, in my video about, that I made as a response to Scola Gladiatoria at uh, the question why did um, English armies fight um, on foot uh, during this uh, this period um, that the um, uh, there was actually a very um, a high proportion of men at arms so of pretty mm, well armed guys like knights the, the equivalent of knights we've seen before the, the guy the guys who had to wear the hauberk and all sleeve or or sleeveless um hauberk uh so 1400 here then we have an equal number of of, of 5600 archers and 5600 armati that were probably that is probably the name actually that was given to the uh, the guys um to the infantry uh melee infantry i believe i i suppose because these were conceived as armed men evidently uh, they are the same number of archers, pretty even. Um, so you have this bulk of men at arms and a pretty consistent number of archers that uh, actually is equal to the one of the infantry. 
uh, of the let's say of the uh, medium infantry. Um, so this is important because it, it is a section that gives a, a pretty clear idea of what English armies had been transformed like in in um, during the first half of the 14th century. Uh, with this very strong component of, of bowmen mm, that was tactically very, very important. Mm. Uh, we know uh, that a battle of uh, the Mills Cross, also known as Battle of Durham, um, um, the um, uh, um, Yorkshire uh, alone fielded, uh, no, and this is also interesting, number of 15 men at arms, 29 hobblers and 3,020 mounted archers. Now this is also, um, um, this is important, Bowden and Wilkes Cross uh, fought in, uh, still part of the, seg uh, of the Scottish Wars of Independence was fought on uh, October 1346 um, and it is therefore an advanced stage a stage of, um, say, of the, the, the in the development of longbow English tactics. Um, and what is interesting here is, um, first of all, the English weren't. Um, I mean, this Yorkshire contingent was evidently something pretty big, also for the uh, for the ar the the consistency of the of the whole army, because the English were something like between six and seven thousands in that battle. Uh, the Scots were less. Um, uh, no, there were more. Sorry, there were like twelve thousands, and they actually got defeated by the English. So uh, we have to look carefully at this um, English army composition, and uh, because Yorkshire here fielded only fifteen men at arms, mm. twenty nine hobbler. The hobbler was like a uh, light cavalry, um, and there were only twenty nine. So this fifteen plus plus 29 makes makes just 44 uh, um, in front of 3,000 <laughs> mounted archers and this is very meaningful because um, it tells you really the huge amount of archers that were available for s from certain from certain territories um, so the um, uh, uh, we have actually some data about how uh, the Lancashire uh, longbowmen uh, received uh, um, a post-battle bonus of ten pound each. Mm. So it was a pretty hefty sum, uh, and it tells you how much they were prized uh, uh, I, uh, at that point. Um, uh, the, um, the the important thing is this battle is that the, the bowmen had basically been protected by men at arms. They actually managed to uh, um, basically, I think, to shoot the Scots in, in first in front, and then uh, when the Scots ad uh, um, advanced, to to actually uh, withdraw behind their men at arms, which is also interesting because it tells you how dynamic this force was in terms of movement on the battlefield. Um, so uh, uh, the 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 English archers had also a, um, an important role in harassing the Scottish uh, uh, during during combat, um, and. Um, um so um there was uh, now I'm not really telling about it, the Battle of Wills Cross because I haven't really um studied it before but essentially it, it's one of those battles in which longbowmen did did a good job overall the the men at arms are kind of the unsung heroes of the battle uh english um longbowmen tactics let's say um longbows tactics let's say and uh but they were actually the ones who carried out most of the actual combat um in hand to hand so they were also pretty elite and what astonishes you is that the english m basically made it against many opponents in this time simply with very few men of arms and lots 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 of archers mm. 
So here you understand that the longbow tactics relied really on the volume of fire that that the longbowmen could achieve altogether. So they were very big numbers. They weren't just a few guy, few elite guys. They were really masses of people that were drawn from England, evidently, uh, where the longbow um, uh, was pretty widespread uh, already before. At least mm, shooting with bow was a normal uh, activity, especially in, in in the country side. And and then eventually, you know, the, mm, um, um, you know, the, the 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 English kings began to issue increasingly more um, um, uh, more consistently the presence of long bowmen. Mm. So simply of, of bowmen with, with larger bows, they were really the same thing of the uh, of the of the normal bows uh, in terms of composition. Um, the um, another thing that uh, we didn't, I think, uh, we didn't tell is that the 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 guys who were recruited from uh, were uh, were basically um, obliged to serve um, for forty days or less. Uh, usually, was longer because you know, a forty days campaign is something very very small. It's actually something was created evidently for the sake of, of the local communities not to stay too long away from their their fields for because most of them were peasants and they had to work the land, take care of local business and all. But as a matter of fact we know that this this kind of jars with the reality of warfare at that time. Uh, campaigns could last several months. So um, the great problem of recruitment was really either getting people who would stay longer than that time. So that's why, as we will see eventually, the English armies also began to switch to, to the uh, to the Indian tour that was conceptually a very very different thing from the Lely. However, it, it should also be said probably s the the, uh, the subjects that were uh, drafted in this sense. Uh, to um to the front to, to to the uh to the war zone were um usually probably stayed longer de facto in into the campaign because uh it doesn't make sense to have recruited this man to have to have made him bring all the materi material and all and just to to see them going away after forty days. First of all there is always a, a mounted feudal leaf there that can Looks at you very in a very grim fashion. It can, can tells you, yeah, you're you're a you're a disgusting commoner, and I'm a noble of of, of of pure blood. And if you try to sneak away, I'm just just to cut you to pieces because this is what basically happened. So there was also a, a certain a certain pride, a certain esprit de corps, um, a certain um, and all necessities for which ov obviously also the crown had invested resources for feeding this man, for keeping them, so they were giving essentially an extra reason for staying in the campaign in one or another, either with threats, either with uh, with simply maintaining them at the crown's expense, that in turn was were always mounted, were drawn <laughs> from the country, so... And uh, as, we, uh, we, as we were saying, there was also probably a kind of national cohesion, because you know, it, it was seen. I mean, think about the Scots. The Scots at this time, into English sources, are depicted like mm, wild beasts, as monsters. So we have to think that probably the common Englishmen loathed the, the the enemy and and understood that if the Scots weren't stopped, they could launch raids into England, l like it happened often. So uh, we we mentioned the guys of Yorkshire before they went fighting uh, uh, at Neville's Cross. Well. You know, the, those guys were in l there in the north were pretty much involved in who was what was happening on the Scottish, uh, on the Scottish border. So they had a personal interest to stop the, the those guys as much as the uh, Scots had a reason to stop the the English. So it's pretty pretty normal, pretty understandable. So the the moral reasons for being there were 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 understandable in many ways, in certain occasions at least. Um, the um, so the uh, the the problem, however, was that um, the kings, the English kings, were starting to push for extra services. Mm. 
to the uh, subjects. This was normal in feudalism. Think about the corvain who were asked to the peasants. Um, those were famous in, in France especially, but broadly in, in old feudal Europe, uh, because essentially those were mm, services, extra services, that were owed at the um, lord's discretion on the on the peasantry. So this kind of uh, elite-minded attitude of saying, you know, I'm the king and, and the subjects just have to obey, was out there, with the only problem that uh, this didn't just go along with for, for the peasantry, but also for the English barons that had the, the Magna Carta <laughs> assigned, and also the constitutions of Clarendon, and all, you know, all the, um, essentially, um, what at this point had been the um, prerogatives that the English kings had recognized to, to the uh, largely to the nobility, but more broadly from a legal point of view to the to the whole English subjects and and as we know, English history has always been about this. I mean, this ab about this compromise, let's say, that existed between the monarchy and the people, um, theoretically for the common good. I in actual fact, especially in these times, for personal interest. So the the, cra the English crown had always to struggle for asking that extra more to to uh, and this is what basically all the other monarchies were doing in a certain fashion because uh, we know that in the, in the Middle Ages the, the monarchies didn't have the, the the power of the modern of our modern states that could basically monopolize everything so it, all the local communities of Europe were kind of in in contrast and in, in in dialectical rela uh, relation from a political and juridical point of view with uh, in front of the uh, royal demands and, and impositions. Um, at the time of Edward II was <laughs> conceived, he's is remembered as a bad king essentially, Edward I, um, uh, great guy, e Edward III even greater, Edward II was this uh, ambiguous figure that uh, in, is remembered also for the um, for an exception in this recruitment um, um, practice for having essentially twisted the interpretation um, of uh, the, these uh, ordinances, uh, basically asking a, a, uh, an extra military service performed to preserve the peace of our realm. Uh, who wouldn't preserve the peace of our realm, right? So go to war, uh, was the idea. <laughs> And um, the um, um, there were actual mm, problems because um, definitely Scots and Welsh were mm, were basically making raids into England, so they had to be repelled in a certain way. So uh, in that case, even the local communities were evidently uh, willing to to take arms against the invaders. But sometimes the campaigns were led against or uh, in, into Wales or Scotland. So uh, at that point, w w um, yeah, you might preserve the peace of the realm by uh, preventing, uh, um, let's say, uh, um, um, counter, um, by, um, um, uh, let's say, preventing a, 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 a future invasion, but you're essentially, uh, it was here essentially the English invading the enemy lands. So, um, and and it, it had always been a problem in this sense to, to, to raise an arm, an English army, to, 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 to go fight it in another, let's say, in another country. It's not in England, and it's not that, uh, um, that Wales and Scotland are that uh, enormously far <laughs> or different from England, but you have to think about the mobility of that time was it was a problem for the all aforementioned reasons to, to move an army to go fight in a foreign, of a de facto foreign land, um, for not talking about France um, uh, across the channel. Um, so the um, the um, these this interpretation will remain basically out there throughout uh, uh, actually a long time because it was basically dropped by the, uh, the English monarchs uh, after repeated parliamentary insistence in um, only at the beginning of the 15th century. So you understand that even what um, what the 
much of the right at, uh, at that time was based on the the the, the habit, the customs. Mm -hmm. Even English law, the, the 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 common law was based on this. I mean, it had always been in that way. So let's keep it that way because it's our right, it's our English tradition that has gloriously formed our kingdom and all so that's that was really the the that is still the the English uh, juridical mindset which uh, in fact has originated the the uh, the, the this big um, a juridical tradition of common law that eventually um, England exported um, uh, in many other countries of the world um, in opposition to, to civil law um, the um, so um, the, um, the 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 consequence under Edward II's reign is that objectively certain um, militias uh, really mm, um, actually served uh, with arms and armors. Uh, um, um, paid by essentially the local community um, and, uh, and and on one occasion uh, the, um, the duration of service was extended even to 60 days formally I believe so um, it was longer uh, as we've seen uh, there was even an actual attempt of formally um, extending the uh, the duration of the service for for, for two months um, the and, and you can imagine however the, the, the enormous resistance that existed against uh, these um, these uh, uh, commissions of uh, uh, totally unusual commissions of RA and and this generated also the discontent during Edward II's reign um, the um, so the communes were basically uh, this is interesting because it was the communes the so-called uh, gens de commune that was uh, asked for uh, to 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 pay the extras of of this um, um, arrays and uh, and and under especially at the beginning uh, Edward the Third's reign was a um, uh, there was a sort of coming back of the crown uh, to the to what had been established by the statute of Winchester, uh, and that was a good occasion because um, Edward was uh, Edward III was a new new king, so that was also a moment into which you know when when these monarchs r rose to the throne, they uh, they they were uh, it was the occasion for essentially re. Uh, reshaping the the, uh, the political balancement for asking for new uh for new um uh for, for certain changes for setting up something w that would have hopefully been maintained um during um, throughout the, the, the whole reign so evidently here the uh, the beginning of the um of the 14th century the the english crown had tried to push uh, insistently f towards something more more centralized uh, to, towards a, a greater intervention on the um, um, on the uh, let's say of the military affair, of the military organization of the state and instead the um, the English people uh, refused um, these are very important iron arms um, to to really measure even the, the power of of the monarchy at the time, mm. um, so uh, the uh, however even during Edward III's reign that as we all know I, at least I hope uh, was uh, an extremely important reign for um, for for um, actually for Western warfare for medieval warfare um, especially during the 30s and the 50s of the of the century, um, new commissions were um, were basically uh, issued, um, especially with a, with an increased um, 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 quality of arms and armor than one prescribed by the Statute of Winchester, especially for the hobblers and the mounted archers. Um, 
this is interesting because according to me it, it, it actually means that these lighter troops were were, using, were increasingly more prized into the kind of um, let's say um, um, meta seasonal in let's say professional kind of um, of, of campaigns that were uh, beginning to to take place in in France. Um, so those hobbylers we've seen this is kind of this medium cavalry and uh, mounted archers are mm, pretty a uh, pretty useful a pretty useful uh, tactical tool to you know harass the enemy, make ambushes, um, and the, the it was very important for you know paving the road to 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 the bulk of the army to from a strategical point of view during their their uh, chevauche in the in in, in the French uh, countryside. So um, it is um, probably Edward's the thir Edward the Third. We can trust Edward III's <laughs> military um, uh, intuitions, definitely. So uh, I think that was actually the reason. So extra arm and armor, because this is important also from 1285 uh, to the 30s and 50s of the 14th century, uh, European equipment had a sharply uh, uh, changed. It definitely had increased in... Uh, in terms of protection and all, so here you see basically the uh, the uh, conservative nature of of uh, the English rights that basically clashes against the um, uh, the evolution of warfare mm, and and of military needs. So the the, the English people are saying, oh, but the 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 um, you know, the state of, of Winchester said that we only own this kind of equipment. Yeah, okay, but that equipment has become obsolete. So if you want the, the English armies to win, you have to be better equipped. And, and these were things that evidently were so... Um, um, uh, you know, that, that were very important. It wasn't just a uh, caprice, let's say, of 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 the uh, of the English monarch, it was really evidently a, a tactical need. They needed better equipped troops, and um, and, if, uh, and 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 if Edward the Third broke the, the his initial promises, it was evidently for for a necessary reason. Um, um, in this sense, um, the um, and, and there was even a, a, a light, um, um, a light uh, distortion of in the requirements of the uh, 15 pounds class uh, that was um, called upon to supply the former. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and there was also a revision of the statue issued um, between uh, 1345 and, and 1346 that basically increased the especially the amount of um, of mounted archers practically and of hobbylers as as we have seen so basically for um, the um, yeah l l let's stick to this because um there was also some sort of cumulative um and there is also another thing that starts happening and at this point it is essentially what happens when there is a crisis of recruitment when society is changing where war the nature of warfare is changing when you're heading towards professionalism that is happening in this time in uh, in medieval history um that is essentially that if you are rich if you're wealthy enough to provide arms to the for your uh, military service, you um, you can uh, exchange essentially your personal participation to the army by sending someone else, or maybe um, providing um, an extra mm, uh, in in place of that. And this is something really that existed everywhere. I've seen, for instance, the Longbird. Um, a military um, the, uh, recruitment system um, in uh, the beginning of the eighth century already contemplated that you know if you if you were you could um, you could sometimes even pair you know if 
uh, a certain amount of, uh, of equipment was required. There could be two people who could put together to, to, to give one, essentially. And maybe uh, one provided the equipment, the other went to war, stuff like that. So this was really normal. Um, it was really the norm uh, throughout all medieval history. But it's very meaningful that this starts appearing in the first half of the 14th century in England compared to the previous statute, because it actually tells you that what was really happening. So English armies um, that were fighting for months and months into France, um, which was bringing incidentally to an increase of professionalization. So it wasn't really the English subjects that were there. It was substantially uh, mercenaries that were hired to do that. Uh, m many of them might have been actually English men, English subjects, but they, wor they were going there essentially as volunteers um, for making a living out of that. Uh, so, um, the idea is that when, uh, I, this is really the crucial point, is that when war goes, um, surpasses uh, seasonalism, so the idea that uh, warfare takes place for a short amount of time, lo like those 40 or 60 days issues by the Sadiot of the Winchester, Basically, you enter in a new uh, in, in a new phase of, of, of military of warfare of military organization. You're passing to professionalism, hence you're passing to a system that evidently cannot be sustained by the world population. So the world population cannot go to war uh, for longer time. So you basically pay for some specialists uh, to go to war and to to refine basically to to make people pay for, for those fewer specialists and, and, and let the other people home. This happened partially also because it was evidently uh, an economical crisis as well. Uh, the 14th century was at all, wasn't at all a happy um, uh, century for English economy. Uh, we think of that century of the century of English glory on the French battlefields. Think about uh, Recy, about Poitiers. Uh, and all, but really the 14th century is a mess uh, at home back in England. Um, there, are there are continuous economical uh, problems, uh, warfare going on, brigandage and all. So um, this is actually a picture that repeats itself into history many times, obviously always in a different fashion because history never repeated itself, not even once. But I mean it's really how certain societies evolve. Uh, when societies become very rich, usually at this time where, where also law is kind of, um, doesn't have many, there aren't many means of law enforcement, central authority is weak and all, you see that there are always uh, wealthier guys at the top, um, fewer wealthier guys at the top and, and lots of poorer people at the bottom of society. So that means that also in terms of the ideal of the citizen, um, uh, pe peasant, um, uh, no, the cis citizen soldier, you know, the peasant who has all the equipment for going to war and uh, then coming back to, to, to work on, on his fields, you know, so like uh, Cincinnatus in, in Roman history, um, is an ideal that is simply, first of all, it's never been met historically, but uh, that even if it had come close to that in, in certain occasions, we'd have sort of roughly well-off middle class, at a certain point when there are these social differences and this economical crisis that crumbles and basically you don't even have the people to draw uh, into the army, not because there aren't people but because they, they cannot, pro they cannot d they're, they're too poor either to provide for their own equipment either to, to pay for it in, s in some other way. So um, this is what, what's going on. Um, the, um, it's very interesting also to see that there is an increase in, in mounted troops, both in mounted infantry and, um, uh, in mounted infantry in general, so mounted archers as we've seen. Um, um, the, um, um, and, 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 and relatively to the um, to the um, revision of the Statute of Winchester between 1335 and 1346, we 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 see that in 1346 
the uh, troops that were recruited um, by uh, the English kingdom were uh, uh, were uh, actually uh, shipped off to the siege of Calais. Mm. So uh, they were sent overseas, and um, so even for I, I guess for a longer time it was pr was prescribed, and we're talking about. Um, uh, thirty, uh, twenty-three thousand uh, people out of the thirteen, uh, thirty-two thousand were expected. So here also gives you the the dimension of the of the theoretical nature uh, of of the recruitment uh, statutes. Um, the um, we find that this army essentially men at arms, um, armati that were could be also male horsemen. Before I said there were infantry, but yeah, at this point it seems to be an as was saying an increased use of mounted infantry, hobbilers and archers. Mm -hmm. um, so um, there was a lot of parliamentary disapproval for this um, for these extras. Um, and in 1352, Edwards, uh, um, Edward III, uh, basically uh, reluctantly um, um, consented uh, by claiming that uh, to, to these um, to these uh, um, protests by stating that no one shall be constrained to find men at arms, hobbyers, nor archers, except those who have already held land by such service, um, if, it, if it be not by common assent and grant made in Parliament. Mm. Uh, so uh, here you see once again the increasing military needs of the English monarchy and the increasing resistance it was, uh, that it met um, um, uh, in, in England by the, uh, the Parliament. So uh, this was, in, in this sense, a sort of parliamentary victory because definitely uh, the, the English uh, monarchs understood that they couldn't ask for, for more. Um, the, um, uh, the, um, the, the ratio, uh, uh, during the French wars, the ratio of levied soldiers to retinues uh, soon um, turned uh, from uh, the um, fif five to two uh, uh, um, of Calais of 1347 to two to three um, uh, in the army mustered instead in 1359. So an obvious increase and eventually uh, which uh, in into professionalism that uh, professionals basically surpassed the the uh, the ladies. Uh, this was happening all over Europe, telling the truth. Um, um, so um, the, um, the the after the times of uh, Edward III, it seems that the militia basically um, was uh, levied uh, mostly just for service in England. So I g either against rebels or the Welsh, the Scots, and um, and there was uh, there was some militia that appeared in France during the Hundred Years' War after this, but in very small numbers. Mm. Um, and sometimes um, the uh, the indentur retinues were provided by drafting certain archers by. Uh, that wa was raised uh, by the conventional commission commissions of array um, and um, so the but the, the majority of the troops that served in in, in France were definitely uh, mercenaries mm. uh, so the uh, the red news based on the indenture contract um, um, basically um, changed the face of the English recruitment. Uh, it kind of m it was kind of the uh, sunset of the feudal era in many ways because um, the of the feudal era recruitment at least, and you'll see that basically all the great um, late medieval armies were 
not made up of commoners of, of feudal levies but actually by mercenaries or soldiers that were paid in some some form uh, for for services that were that went beyond uh, the original ones that were owed to the crown as from you know the old Germanic times of the of the of the hairy bun um, so where theoretically all the able mm, freemen able-bodied uh, male freemen were to to serve into the army um, and this is really um, how eventually um, the 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 European armies remained for largely for for all over the until an, until the nation state uh, yeah. until the the uh, the creation actually even before and during the modern age of this increasingly larger bodies of of um, of statal troops of statal salaried troops which went along. Uh, with the idea that uh, mercenaries were fine most of the times, but uh, they had mm, the state had to find um, a more reliable way of finding troops, so I'm not relying on on private, um, let's say, um, businessmen or of war, but really raising uh, armies uh, on their own, so controlling the troops in their own barracks, in their own, uh, you know, creating a um, a weapon, uh, re, um, a state of weapon reproduction and distribution system by therefore creating a, a bureaucratic apparatus for levying taxes from the population. It was all often done in this sense by essentially saying, okay, you don't, uh, to the local communities, you don't have um, any um, duties essentially to participate to the army anymore as long as you pay for it, as you pay the taxes for, for, uh, for the state to rise other people then eventually the nation state arrived and the whole thing changed again because at that point the nation state was a able mm, at least uh, relatively to its economical capabilities to raise um, all theoretically all the the um, the, the able-bodied men um, without um, essentially without even <laughs> asking for consent um, England remained actually largely um, a voluntary um, um, English army was largely voluntary it's just, it's just during the, the Napoleonic times and, uh, uh, and during from the First World War that basically the, the state issued people to, to participate to, I mean to, 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 to record people um, to go to, to war because at th up to that point it was had to be mostly voluntary uh, had to be voluntary um, but now we are over first of all oversimplifying sometimes for the sake of synthesis but <laughs> uh, this is not uh, really a concise way <laughs> of of discussing because we're we, we started with the Middle Ages we arrived to the World War I but what I'm saying is, however, that um, even though these all these numbers or all these ordinances sometimes are kind of boring to to read and to to understand, but but telling the truth, to they show really probably the uh, the um, the real nature of warfare this point I mean even before the battles because you can't study the battles at this time of the hundred years war and wonder why I don't know the, the English obtained so many results tactically speaking and um, um, and not understanding what's behind those armies um, and not understanding that professionalism was kicking in so that uh, there were uh, definitely professionalism added much to the victories of uh, the English victories in France together obviously with the uh, uh, with the tactics in the let's say formalized by uh, Edward III canonically speaking for the English army uh, at that point and uh, also the French mistakes and all but um, it's really s mm, politics and society behind what happens on even on the battlefield really because even if tactics have a 
kind of a um, set of rules on on their own um, um, and the the battle is a kind of of an environment on its own it's still the people who fight in it are the product of a society of a political system and there is a big difference between the uh, the English armies of the end of the 13th century and uh, and, and the one of of the mid um, second half of the 14th so um, this differences have to be understood on uh, on the light of such um, transformations in, in recruitment um, in uh, in economical terms mm -hmm. in socio economical terms so okay <laughs> let me see how long this lasted one hour and 54 minutes fine so okay um, I hope that you enjoyed this video as usual <laughs> um, if you did please share it otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you want to receive further news about my contents and for now I thank you heartily for listening to me I wish you a nice time and see you next time bye